Welcome to On the Brink, a fresh lens to take you and your business to new heights. Hi, I'm Andy Simon, your host, and it's always a pleasure to bring to you people who are going to help you see, feel, and think in new ways. Remember, my job is to get you off the brink and soar again, and we are facing some really serious crises in American society, in world society today, and all of us are beginning to wonder, how can we deal with these crises in ways that will help us go past them, recover, and rebuild our society in a healthy way? So today, I have two wonderful individuals that I just enjoy meeting. They are just important for you to know and for me to share. Dr. Elia Gorgoras is the founder of the Happiness Center. It's an organization of world-leading experts in the field of positive psychology. If you don't know much about positivity, I, am, I will write up on the blog information about um, people who, like Kim Cameron, who are doing positivity work. When we work with organizations to help them change, positive organizations are much more successful than those that aren't. It's important to build it into your repertoire. They've helped thousands of individuals personally and professionally achieve happiness, success, and wellness. And Dr. Elia's book is Happiness and Wellness Expert. It's a number one best-selling author of Seven Paths to Lasting Happiness. I think that we're going to end with that so that you have a little bit about how to rebuild your happiness. The book that we're going to focus on today, though, he co-authored with Coach Khan Apostolopoulos, a new book called Seven Keys to Navigating a Crisis, a Practical Guide to Emotionally Dealing with Pandemics and Other Disasters. Coach Khan's background, he's the founder and CEO of Fresh Biz Solutions. Now, this is a human capital management consulting group, and it provides performance improvement and training solutions to help organizations really thrive, improve their business results, reap great benefits from comprehensive talent management. If you listen to the two of them, they have different perspectives on the same problem we have to solve, which is how do we build better teams, better leaders, and really deliver a workplace that can thrive. Now, during these crises times, the question for us and for the three of us today is how do we deal with crises and do it better? Thank you, Dr. Elia and Coach Khan for joining me. Thank you for having us. Thank you, Andy, for having us. I ask our, our guests to tell a little bit about your own journey. Uh, Dr. Elia, shall I start with you? Different you journey than Coach Khan's, but the two of you have become great colleagues and friends. So first, about yourself. Well, my, uh, I'm originally from Greece, I came to America as an immigrant with my, with my family. Uh, I was 10 years old, I lived in Santa Monica in California and uh, loved it. Went to UCLA, went on to get my PhD in psychology and had a first half of my professional career as a clinical psychologist. And then I transitioned to the corporate world and uh, executive coaching, leadership training and development. And obviously happiness is at the core of who I am. I, I try to live it. And I try to share that positivity. Uh, I have opportunities to lecture around the world now. It's gone beyond the United States. And last year I had uh, opportunities to speak in Rome and Paris and London and Athens. And uh, it's, it's, it's growing. So it's a wonderful thing to have. And as, you're, you know, as your sphere of influence grows in life, so does the responsibility to you to, to be authentic, to be real, and to try to walk the talk. And I think Coach Khan and I would try to do that together. Uh, we're best friends, we're colleagues, we, we write together, and uh, as you'll come to know, this book came about, it was a labor of love, um, and we're, we're very proud of the book because I think it's going to help a lot of people, just like my first book, Seven Past Lasting Happiness, that's helped tens of thousands of people, so we're excited to share some of those concepts and some of those practical tools with you, and Coach Khan, you're up. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, very much like Dr. Ilya, Andrea. Uh, I am a first generation here in the States. I've uh, been here for about 25 years now. Um, and uh, interestingly enough, I'm originally from Greece. If uh, our Irish names didn't give it away. Uh, <laughs> and I've journeyed, uh, I consider myself a, a citizen of the world. I was actually born in Australia to Greek immigrant parents at the time. So not only am I a first generation immigrant, I'm a son of first generation immigrants. So I've, I've experienced that story multiple times. I've lived my life in three different continents and worked on four. And I have a perspective from that of change, of different cultures, and uh, of different 
industries through that process as well. Over my career, I've had the blessing and the opportunity to be able to work in a variety of different industries, ranging from entertainment and hospitality to travel to call centers, now recently working with construction companies, with higher ed, and being able to view um, a lot of the similarities and differences that each one of them brings. Uh, I realized throughout my tenure, throughout my career, that people are people. And the problems and the challenges that we face are fairly universal. There's a lot of common themes and common threads that we can bring from one area to another, from one culture, from one industry to another. And that's where, with my organization now, with Fresh Biz Solutions, that's a big part of what we do. We take best practices from one area, and we're able to transplant and cross-pollinate into other areas. If there's one thing we can count on, and we all know it, is that change is inevitable. So we're trying to help navigate that change professionally. And now through this crisis that we're dealing with right now, we're trying to help leaders and individuals navigate this change themselves. Uh, the reason I'm so honored to have Dr. Elia and Coach Khan on is that I did my doctoral research on Greek immigrants into the United States and returned migration to Greece. And I was fascinated with how people can keep the same terms and language, but completely modify and adapt their cultures to different environments. And when they go home again, it's difficult. And then when my daughters were four and five, I spent three months on an island studying Greek women. And so there's a deep part of my heart to the world that you uh, come from and the world that has really made so much of a part of my life. Let's talk about the crisis today, though. Your book, Seven Keys to Navigating a Crisis, A Practical Guide. Um, tell us about the seven keys and how to make a practical guide out of this because uh, we used to preach that we work with organizations that need to change as anthropologists and we say if you want to change have a crisis or create one I mean, little did I know we were going to have this type of crisis and then the next crisis and all of a sudden everything we hold to be true and sacred is falling apart and for humans ambiguity is the most dangerous place to be the twixt in between is not healthy um, shall I start with Dr. Elliot? Tell us about the emergence of the book and then Coach Khan, how it begins to apply. I think that would work well as a conversation today. Thank you. Honestly, Andy, the emergence of the book came, I had a very strong prompting, very strong, like, uh, you know, and, and actually the second key to navigating in crisis is awareness, like listening with the third ear, if you will. Some people might call it your intuition, your inner wisdom the spirit of God, whatever you want to call it. And it was so loud and clear to me and said, you got to get a book out and write about the pandemic and this come out in May. Mind you, this was, beware the Ides of March. This was March 15th when I had this uh, <laughs> revelation of sorts. <laughs> and the first thing I did, I picked up the phone. I'm like, uh, Coach Khan, my friend, I call him Costa. I'm like, we got to write this book. Are you in or are you out? And he didn't hesitate for one second. He goes, I'm in. So we spent the next 45 days head down and we worked and we did our research and our due diligence, and we got the ebook out May 1st, so we hit our deadline, and then the paperback came out uh, May 10th. And now, you know, we're doing interviews every single day from all over the world. I just did one this morning in, in Greece, believe it or not. Um, <laughs> but India, South Africa, I mean, we, we're in, because this is, we, we're dealing with universal issues right now, not just American issues. So. Well, tell us about it. What, what did you pulling from your psychology background, your psychology background, and your coaching background, these seven things aren't any old things. They're important for a, a person to understand in a sequence. It's a good book. Um, share it. Um, and then we'll go to Coach Khan because I'd like him to talk about how to apply it. I think that that's what I'm looking for. Okay. I mean, the first one, of course, is self-care because if, if we don't take care of ourselves, if both you know, physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually, we're going to be struggling greater than, uh, you know, because we're dealing with multiple crises. We're living in unprecedented times. Initially, you know, the book was written for, about the coronavirus, COVID-19, the pandemic. But then you throw in the financial crisis. At least in, in, in America, we have 40 million unemployed right now. It's just the last 60 days. We're dealing with a mental health crisis, depression, anxiety, um, Stress-related symptomatology is up by 700% and growing. Uh, suicides, uh, drug and alcohol abuse, you know, even domestic violence, all of those things are going up because people are so stressed out. Now, of course, you throw in what's happening in the streets of America right now with the unfortunate and horrific death of uh, George Floyd and the and the rioting and the violence and all that. So. I don't, I can't remember in my lifetime where you have four or five simultaneous crises um, in America. And guess what? 
we're in for a long, hot summer. We're not even talking about the natural disasters that are going to hit hurricanes. I mean, there are other things coming this summer. Yep. So in order to be able to just basically survive and keep your head above water, you have to take care of yourself. So Coach Khan and I, you know, created a personal health assessment, which it takes two minutes to take. Five key questions on your physical health, five more on your emotional and, and mental and, and spiritual health, just to see where are you right now? Before you even start reading the book, before you even start, start applying the keys and the practical tools that we have. And Coach Khan, you can talk a little bit about why this is more of a workbook than uh, you know, an intellectual or an academic book. We wrote this book, number one, I, personally for me, I didn't write it as a PhD, and I wrote it from my heart. We want mm-hmm. to help people, whether you're 18 years old or you're 80 years old, here's some practical things you can do. And Coach Khan, you can take it from there. Yeah, the book in essence is is something that we, we we put out there as Dr. Ilya mentioned in a very very short order. But a big part of that was because we felt the sense of urgency. As we looked around, everybody was trying to do their part to help. Everybody was trying to figure out how can we deal with this crisis individually, collectively. Um, a big part of a calling that we felt was how can we give back from our area of expertise? Um, we couldn't cook. I mean, we could, but we can't cook for that many people to feed them. So we figured. Let's give them something that nourish the soul a little bit, nourish the mind to be able to help from that perspective and help people navigate this process. When we talk about self-care, I mean, a big part of that is uh, our ability to cope with change. And you know this better than anybody, Andy, is the sense that it's like a sponge. And that sponge over the course of time and over the issues that we've had has been saturated. And we're pouring more and more liquid on the sponge. Well, at some point, it's not going to be able to hold anything more. That's why it's so important for us, first and foremost, to look at ourselves and say, okay, let me take a moment. I need to figure out where I'm at and figure out how can I nourish myself, take a moment and help. I can't help somebody else if I'm not in a good place. I cannot reach down and pick somebody else up if I'm not firmly on my own feet. We already had a mental crisis before, had an epidemic going on before that. In the first two months of this pandemic alone, we saw an increase from what numbers we're we're recording, 700% increase in mental health issues. And these are new people reporting problems. These are not chronic issues. These are issues that are escalating rapidly. So that sponge is getting very, very saturated. And that's what we tried to first and foremost address. Our book is written in a very easy to consume way. Dr. Ilya said it himself, we didn't write it from a, from a scientific perspective or, or a high level perspective. It's very down to earth. It's very short, sweet to the point with simple how to's points to consider from that piece and questions to ask yourself like the health assessment. And even beyond that, when we extrapolate the information that we have, all of these keys that we identified are things that team leaders, organizational leaders, business leaders can take and extrapolate. Look at the self-care of your own organization. Are you taking care of your people? Are you taking care of what's important to you as an organization? Are you looking at, I mean, just the simple fact, let's put it in practical terms, because my background is coming from a corporate standpoint. Are we going to need to even reevaluate simple things like our benefits that are offering, our work conditions that we need to to restructure for our people? This is self-care to make sure that, first and foremost, we don't create more problems, do no more harm from this. That's the Hippocratic Oath. And even within our first chapter here, we have a section on self-care for healthcare. Those Mm -hmm. frontline warriors that we look at, the nurses, the doctors, the medical staff, the people stocking the shelves, the people bringing all of the essentials to keep our society open right now. These are things that we have to take care of first and foremost. And then from there, we transition into awareness. Dr. Ilya, would you like to talk more about that? Can I ask one thing before you do? Go ahead. I mean, you can jump into that, but you're giving permission to people to be concerned about themselves. Mm-hmm. I don't want to lose that because often they feel a bit guilty if they're concerned about themselves at a time. And, and I felt the same because we are we have friends who have been impacted, but uh, and businesses we know who have been seriously impacted to care about them doesn't mean you can't care about yourself. And I don't think that they're mutually exclusive. I just want to emphasize that if you are going to give care out, you also have to give care inside. And and, and that's what you're saying. Is that correct? Yeah, that is absolutely correct. And that is essential. Uh, Not only are they not mutually exclusive, they are codependent from that. I cannot give from what I don't have. Yes. 
And I was going to tell you that I practiced that, you know, the putting the self-care in not just theoretical or for, for everybody else to do it, but not for my, myself. Before <laughs> all this, all this crisis hit, I used to go for a walk, you know, three times a week for an hour, you know, get three miles in each time because I had to, because I felt like, Hey, Ilya, you're getting older. You gotta get out, You gotta move. Right. <laughs> well, guess what? The stakes are a lot higher. And, and that was more like, I have to do it. Right. Well, now, I, I created, I'm, I've been walking seven days a week every month for the last two months because I want to, because uh-huh. I realized that I need to be outside, you know, being quarantined, I need to walk outside. I need to breathe the fresh air. I need to hear the birds sing. I need to look at the sky. I need to look at, it's springtime, you know, going into summer, everything's turning green because that, you know, releases, as you know, yeah, chemicals right. in your brain. It makes you feel better. It, it, it boosts your immune system. That's so right. I've had to do my own self-care to deal with all these crises and then try to help all these other people. Now, yeah. the economy is opening up. So we have companies that have been shut down for a couple of months. Employees are coming back. Guess what? All of these employees have been traumatized to one degree or another. Yes. So senior leaders from HR directors and up, CEOs and, and so on, they need to understand that their workforce is not the same like it was before. Yes. They almost need to be I know Coach Khan used the, like, you know how we do onboarding when you're a, a new employee? Okay, it's a new re-onboarding, in essence, of existing employees because they're not the same people that were 60 days ago. With it's not exactly post-traumatic stress disorder, but it has some of the same elements to it. And then, uh, Coach Khan, you were going to you know, follow up on Dr. Elias because I think that, that from the dysfunction of the organization, those people who are coming back, if I hear you correctly, are coming back as different people. They are, and so is the environment, Andy. Mm -hmm. From that perspective, not only are they different, but also the environment. When we look at the people that are coming back in, each one of them may may perceive this this, this crisis in a very, very different way. And they have, depending on what their experience has been, what their background has been, they may manifest their reaction to it very, very differently. So leaders across organizations are going to have to take the time now. We just can't pick up where we left off. We have to essentially yeah. re-onboard people and we have to make sure that they are reoriented into this new environment because physically it's going to be different because of distancing. Uh, there may be an environment where all of a sudden you had a huge office that was full of people and vibrant life. And all of a sudden there's one person here, one person, three cubicles down there, one person on the other side of the office. That's a very different environment that people need to get oriented to. Yep. And, Go ahead. and I was going to say part of the awareness that you talked about, Coach Khan, is when we go back as senior leaders, you know, typically when I say, how are you doing today, Andy? I'm good. You know, that's typically, but we need to take the extra step and say, no, seriously, how are you really doing? How is your family? Let me close the door. Let me spend five or 10 minutes with you. You know, I would say anybody that has any direct reports, they need to have this, what I call stay interviews, not exit interviews when it's too late, but stay interviews and, and, and show that you really care because at some point people, you know, they don't care how much you know until they know how much you truly care. So we can't have just a superficial, how are you doing today? Oh, you're fine. Okay, that's good. I don't want to hear your problems. It's got to be, no, seriously, I really want to know how are you doing? And that mm-hmm. care towards your employees, not only obviously bonds the team and, and strengthens your relationships, but also eventually creates loyalty. The bottom line is that happy employees are healthier, physically healthier. They're less depressed. They're more productive. They're more collaborative. So there are benefits that impact even the, even the bottom line. But given everything that's going on right now, we, we as, because I work with senior leaders and so does Coach Khan, we can't go back to business as usual. We coach now senior leaders say, you know what, you have to show up differently. Forget business as usual. If you want to gain into the hearts of your employees, you have to show up differently, more they know how more to? patient, more understanding. Yep. Um, Dr. Elia, the, the thing that I've learned working with people about their aspirations to change or the need to is they don't know how to. And as I'm listening yeah. to you, I'm saying we can tell them that they have to change expectations, how they communicate, um, but I often find that without some role playing, some training, some active learning, th- they're clueless. And the words sound really good. And then they go back to what their most habit driven habits right. are. And it backfires because the intentions were good, but the skill sets are missing. Um, Coach Khan, you're going to say something. I'm sorry. 
Yeah, no, I, I want to I want to carry forward the conversation and the thoughts that the, the the train of thought that Dr. Ilya and you have just presented from this piece. I mean, filling that void of competence at this point and helping yeah. people understand, helping our leaders be able to do that is a big part of what we offer our clients right now. And through our conversations with them, these role playing events, these these learning how to to execute these skills, it's an important for many of for many of our leaders. It's going to become a very different world that they're going to have to adapt to. Yes there's going to be a situation where they're going to have to balance two competing forces almost inside them. On one hand, they're going to have to display practically a lot more empathy. But on the other hand, they may have to step in and be and show some tough love from that perspective. There's going to be situations where they may have to step in and set healthy boundaries for their team and be able to kind of put them at ease from that perspective. We're seeing signs already that, you know, we have people that are burning out because they didn't know how to, how to cope with the crisis. Therefore, they went overboard and started working 18 hours a day in order to deal with that because that was what was familiar and comfortable with them. Yeah. Whereas on the empathy side, we, we need to be able to reach out to people on a human nature. What, what taboos we may have had in the past where we said, okay, well, I can't cross that line because it's the personal life. Right now, we're dealing with Zoom calls where we have kids kids screaming down in the background, running across the screen. All of a sudden, corporate calls, CEOs and their C-suite executives are sitting around in their T-shirts and jeans and the kids are playing in the background. This is the most human we've ever seen each other and the yeah. most vulnerable. But that level of nakedness, we can either use it for a benefit and come closer together as a team, or we can use that as pointing fingers to each other saying, you don't know what you're doing. So we yeah. have to be aware of that. There's also, I'll, I'll toss in, because I'm, I'm working with two leadership academies that we're building, and the folks there are dealing with loss. They've had to furlough and fire people. And the ones who are coming back now haven't gone through mourning, um, but they were their colleagues. And so there's this whole mourning part that I just want to in, sort of throw into our mix of things, because that's a, a true feeling, that if we ignore, we'll never let them recover the honesty or the integrity that they have or the trust. I, I don't know if you're finding some of the same, but it's, uh, it's harder for them to let them go and then um, resolve the, the loss as if somebody has died. It's, um, it's really cool stuff. Dr. Elia, are there, you, you gave us a couple. We have awareness, we have self-awareness, we have listening. There are seven more, sure. The next one has to do with flexibility because you know, we say that it's not that the strong will survive all this crisis, it's the flexible. And, mm. and we'd like to use the example of the oak tree in the palm tree. And in the oak tree, of course, is this massive, massive tree that sometimes has been around for 100 years, tall, huge, right? But if you get enough moisture and then you get enough wind, guess what happens to oak trees? They come crashing <laughs> down right. on cars, people, <laughs> houses. I mean, they destroy things, right? And then on the flip side, you have a very thin, sometimes tall palm tree, which at the peak of the storm basically bends almost parallel to the ground, all the way down, flat almost. And then when the wind and the, and the hurricane passes, it slowly raises itself up and then it's still standing. So we ask each one of you to be palm trees, not oak trees. And, you know, athletes know that better than everybody else, right? If they don't stretch, if they're not flexible before the game, guess what happens? They get injured. So it's the same thing, but now we're, we're in, a, in a marathon. Actually, we're in an ultra marathon. Yes. You know how you sometimes you say, well, life is not a sprint, it's a marathon. Yeah, well, now we're ultra marathon because a marathon isn't even enough. With multiple crises happening at once, we're running like not 100K, 1,000K. So we have to show that adaptability and flexibility. And again, going back to the corporate world, the same is true for leaders. That's why we keep saying, look, you got to make adjustments. You got to adapt your approach, your leadership style. You have to stretch. You have to show up <laughs> better than you ever have before if you want to gain that kind of following and, you, and that kind of trust with your employees who are scared to death, overwhelmed, tired, maybe even depressed, anxious because of the unknown. You, as a corporate um, anthropologist, you know this better than anybody else. We don't, we don't like when things are out of our control. No. Now you have multiple things out of control all at the same time. That's why I said we're living in unprecedented times. I could probably handle one crisis, maybe two. But when you pile on three or four, 
Well, yeah. okay, then I'm overwhelmed. And I'll, I'll comment on that in, in a moment. I want Coach Khan to comment on it first, and then I'll throw a little anthropology um, thoughts into your mix, because I do, do think that we come from different perspectives, and that is exciting to listen to. Coach Khan. So let me, let me kind of, again, but tie, tie some of those points together. You talked about those transitions that we feel that morning, that loss that we have. I mean, when we talk about that, essentially we're grieving because our old way of life is no yes. longer there. So that's the ending. So change, as you know, has a beginning, a middle, and an end. It's just flipped. It starts with an ending. It starts mm -hmm. with an ending of the old way of doing things. And now we're in this free fall transition period. We're like a diver that jumped off the cliff, but we haven't landed anywhere yet. And we are in midair right now. We are being bombarded with multiple crises. And we, are, we don't know what's up. We don't know what's down. Now we can either embrace this and use this as a time of ex experimentation, of innovation, of a way of capitalizing in different ways and really enjoying the fact that I have a few extra hours with my family. I don't have to be stuck in traffic somewhere. We can, we can use this as an opportunity as long as we are flexible during this time. Every crisis in itself has produced innovation. I mean, the last recession that we have in 2008 produced new industries, Uber, Airbnb, now, granted, these are struggling right now in this crisis, but again, who's to say that what's next from that perspective that's going to come out of this thing? But we can look at this as an opportunity for us now to re, 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 retool ourselves and use this time to be flexible. In the past, I remember 20 years ago working with a client in call centers where we had a situation where we were experimenting with how do we work remotely. The case for remote work has been made year after year after year. Yes. The numbers are there, but what was missing were two key elements, trust from management and the technology to make it happen. Well, now they're forced to trust people because they don't have a choice and people are proving that they are worthy of that trust because they're more than capable of producing above and beyond what they would in the office. And now the technology is catching up. Case in point, we are on a video call right now simultaneously three of us where a few years ago that would be unheard of so we are dealing with that situation we just have to be flexible individually to embrace what's happening right now and say it's okay we need to be a palm tree right now not an oak tree we need to use that strength for our benefit not against us right now and looking at that mm -hmm. situation let me ask you, I have three or four thoughts going through my noodle, um, one of which is about storytelling, because um, I'm going to have a session with my folks coming up, and I'm going to, I asked them already to prepare stories to share with us, because the way our brain works is it creates a reality out of the story elements, and we've got our movie sets going on there, and they haven't been together, and I am convinced that the part of the rebonding is going to be commonly shared stories that will give them a context about what has happened and something to share. Are, are stories part of your mix as well? Well, I, I, I think so. Number one, there's a huge difference between danger and fear, yes. right? I think danger is real. If somebody comes up to you and coughs in your face right now, you're in danger. If somebody throws a Molotov cocktail in your direction, you are in danger, right? <laughs> but fear is paralyzing and fear is not our friend. And we do not want to make emotional decisions based on based on fear. So th th that to me is, is we should have shared that for me at the beginning of the, this podcast as, as to set some boundaries. Danger is real, fear is not. Now, when it comes to storytelling, you know there are four types of people when dealing with crisis, and they each tell their own story. Yes. The first type, of course, is the victim, and the victim comes to any crisis. Why is this happening to me? Why did I do to deserve this? My, this is horrible. And it's all about me, even though this is a pandemic or a, a societal issue you know, across the board. So that's one story. The second personality type is the critic. And the critic basically, regardless of what the federal, state, or local government says, or the healthcare <laughs> practitioner say, I, I know uh, what you're going to say. They criticize everything. For example, Andy, you should wear a mask when you go outside. Well, that's stupid. Okay, Andy. Don't wear a mask when you go outside. Well, that's idiotic. Like, no matter what you say, if it doesn't work, <laughs> and it just criticize everything. Yes. Then, of course, we have the third uh, type, which we like to call the bystander. And imagine the deer with the headlights. Look, the, the bystander, a good person, mind you, but overwhelmed by the crisis, 
doesn't know what to do, frozen in fear again, looks to the left, looks to the right, looks what the neighbors are doing, but they basically do nothing. And that's the commonality of the first three, these three types, of course, is that they take no initiative. And Coach Khan will talk about, the, you know, because initiative is one of the things that navigating a crisis. They, they take no initiative. They sit back. They don't offer any solutions. Now we get to the fourth type, which is called the navigator. And our goal, of course, through, you know, sharing the stories with you is that we all want to become navigators yes. because the navigators begin, number one, they do do self-care. They have to. That, that, that's not even an option. They take care of themselves in order to take care of others. And they start off with a positive attitude, which is the sixth key to navigating a crisis. And believe me, we will overcome this. Humanity may be down on one knee and struggling with this pandemic, but we will overcome this. We will find the solutions. We have scientists across the globe working together collaboratively. There will be a vaccine. There will be drugs. This is going to happen. Even in America with our racial issues right now, I'm seeing, I have great hope because I'm seeing some changes happening. Yes. Uh, and, I'm, and you know what? We just have to be patient. It's going to take a while because this has been a long time coming, but we will be, be better because of this. So the navigator basically is flexible, adaptable, prepares, takes initiative, moves into action. And so our call to action to you and to your listeners is be a navigator. Now, as an anthropologist, you know this better than anybody else. All four of those types exist within every human being. That's right. Because we're all imperfect human beings. So when this first started, the first thing that happened, of course, is that all my speaking engagement around the world got canceled. <laughs> so I was the bystander with a head with a deer, like, like what? Now what's going to happen to me? And I, and I became the victim after that. I'm like, oh, no. You know, poor me. I was like, and then, of course, I started, and, and I've, criticized, I've criticized the government there. I hear some stuff in social media or on television. I'm like, that's the stupidest thing ever. However, the key is to not stay stuck, right? And just like Coach Khan and I, we didn't stay stuck in those three roles. We navigated and got to work and we did something different. Believe me, at the beginning of the year, it was not part of our New Year's resolution to write a book about pandemics. In 45 days either. In 45 days, right. <laughs> Actually, my first book took three years to write. So and mine took four. I, I got 45 it. Days, I'm like, I, you're like, you're crazy. I'm like, I know. I, I end up, but I got to do it. So somehow, but it also gave you... Um, about the destination and a, a way of behaving to navigate through the uncertainties that we were in. I want to emphasize that because what I hear and what you've done is a path that others need to understand. They needed a goal. I have to have it done May 1st. I'm going to do this because it's going to help us give back to somebody. There's so many elements of what you've done that are transformative. It wasn't just, I need to write a book. It was, I have a purpose here to help people get through this. It was cool. Um, Coach Khan, you're uh, shaking your head. Your thoughts. <laughs> There, there, there's so many stories here that we brought. I mean, we brought our, in our, even our personal stories. I mean, we're not just uh, advising people. Uh, we're drinking our own Kool-Aid. Yes. We, we, are, we are experimenting on ourselves in many ways. Uh, I'm the father of a, of, a, of a young woman who's class of 2020 graduate oh. who had to deal with... See, the my heart immediately went... Oh. Who had to yeah. deal with the challenges of, of unexpectedly being disconnected from her school, from her friends, from her classmates, not being able to essentially appreciate graduation and that closure after 12, 13 years of school yes. um, and being able to start a new life and going into, into a world now that is forever changed. She was born during another crisis, the 9-11 crisis for us. Yes. So she has been bookended by these things. And I look at that and at, very rarely have I seen her feel like a victim or a critic. Yes. She has put a smile on her face. She has done what she has to do. Like Dr. Ilya said, she does her walking. She gets up. She's been you know, glued to her computer because she's had to do remote learning to finish up all of her schooling and everything. Yes. But yet she has one of those little Fitbits on her wrist and she gets up every hour. She says, Dad, it's walk o'clock. And she gets up <laughs> and starts walking around the house. Not much space to go, but she goes all the way around and she does that with a smile on her face. And she is an inspiration to me. And it sounds all, like she was the book as before there was a book. Exactly. And that's where you look around and you see, okay, where can we draw strength from? I mean, we talked about it. The keys are there. And they're, they're, this is not earth shattering, but it's, it, there's a logic to it. Take care of yourself through self-care. Listen to your voice inside you through awareness. Be flexible in a time like this. Prepare. I mean, one of the things that we didn't talk about, we've seen this happen before. A navigator is not necessarily just somebody who just knows the territory, but they understand 
they can read the surroundings, they can read the environment, and they can learn from previous situations. And that's what they use to navigate this new world. When they come into this new world, they're using what they've learned from previous crises, from 9-11, from Katrina, from different situations, earthquakes in Haiti, shootings, all the things that Dr. Ily has experienced and I have experienced through, uh, through our, our, our past, the recession, all of these have set us and probably many of your listeners on a different course from that. But if we don't learn from those, we are destined to make the same mistakes. And preparation, preparation is key. Why? Because we get luckier the more we prepare, because if we're prepared and the opportunity presents itself, we find ourselves being lucky. It's not just by coincidence from that piece. Navigators are able to prepare for those things. Could anybody have foreseen a pandemic like this? Maybe a few people, but for the most of us, we didn't expect to, to be dealing with a crisis that's going to impact every single living soul on this planet right now. No. Everybody's impacted by this. Add a dimension here. I don't remember if it was in the book or not, but um, the, the whole power of community, mm -hmm. um, the, the part about self-care, about listening, about being flexible, but humans are herd animals. Mm -hmm. And we're, we're mimics and we bond by finding others who share similar ideas like we've bonded. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I want to add into your mix for the crisis to come through it. You're going to find others who are going to affirm your own path, others who are to your victim and so forth. They're going to d disagree with you. You're going to have to find others who are going to help you navigate to where you're going and help you stay account. That, I mean, there's another person in here that becomes extremely important. And, and I don't know if it was in the book or not, but I don't want to lose that power of the other. Am I correct? Maybe, is there something you can add to my thoughts? Yes, and there are. And part of that is we, we manifest that in the final key, which is kindness. Uh -huh. Where Here is where we reach out. We started with self-care and allowing ourselves, giving ourselves permission to take care of our needs in order to help others ultimately. And that's where we come to the last key, which is all about kindness. Because the minute we, we take initiative individually, collectively, and we start reaching out to others, this is where now we have the opportunity to kind of get out of our own head get out of that victim or critic mode or even bystander mode and thrust ourselves into more of a navigator mode where we can start helping others. This makes, this is the right thing to do, but for many organizations, it's always, it also makes good sense from a practical operational standpoint, engaging your people in acts, acts of kindness will empower your people to come together. I mean, even with the positive attitude and everything else, much of that is, this crisis is not going to all of a sudden create character, but it will reveal it individually mm -hmm. and collectively. Organizations now, through their foundations, through their ability to feed the needy, to take care of different things, to take care of their people, are showing their character. Those are the ones that are going to come out of this crisis in a much better place than when they went in. And uh, just to add to that, you know, I'm often asked as a result of this, these crises that we're dealing with, am I my brother's keeper? And, you know, my immediate response is like, no, you're not your brother's keeper. You're your sister's keeper and your mother's keeper and your neighbor's keeper and George Floyd's keeper and somebody else on the other side of the world and the homeless person's keeper because we're all brothers and sisters. We're all, you know, we're all part of one race, the human race. I don't know when people will get that through their heads. There are no other races until we discover Martians. We're all part of the human race, right? <laughs> so... Yes, you are your brothers and your sisters and your daughters and your cousins and your neighbors and your and the homeless person, like I said. And no matter where you are right now in your life, no matter how difficult it might be, you could be unemployed. You could be struggling with domestic issues and relationship issues. So I promise you there's somebody else worse off than you. I yes. promise you that. You just have to look around. So lift up and extend your, your, you know, your hand and lift somebody else up just the way somebody else is going to lift you up, actually. And, and that's mm -hmm. how we get through this crisis, together, united, loving, compassionate. Does that require for us to be vulnerable? I know Coach Khan used that word earlier on. You're darn right. Vulnerability is not easy, but it's necessary. Empathy. You know, all that good stuff. Now is the time to show our best selves. You know, Dr. Elia and Coach Khan, the book that I sort of wanted to end with was your Seven Paths to Lasting Happiness. Uh, because 
Um, the fact that we are in a dysfunctional, disrupted stage uh, doesn't mean that we can't, um, at the beginning, you want to worry about our self-health, but happiness is something that can be built into this, the act of kindness, uh, gratitude. You'd be amazed, people are amazed. Three acts of gratitude, you write down every night and all of a sudden your body feels better and healthier. You talk to a stranger and you both feel happier. There's a wellness factor. Humans need to come and understand where that comes from in the act of giving and caring. Now, thoughts you could share about that and then we'll get close to wrapping up. Sure, I, I think happiness and kindness are interconnected. You can't have one without the other. Happy people by nature tend to be kind and help other people because they're, they their batteries are full. Their whole system is full, right? Of love and, and everything else. On the other hand, when we do perform acts of kindness or acts of service towards somebody else, that innately makes us feel better deep down inside. So it benefits both the giver and the receiver. Um, the one thing about the seven paths of lasting happiness is this. Again, that book was written from my heart. I could have written an academic book. There's nothing new in the book, honestly. So the people say, well, how did it become a number one bestseller? It's because because it's practical. At the end of every chapter, I have points for people to think and consider, questions to uh, answer, but then more importantly, take action because knowledge without application is just education. Yes. Not that there's anything wrong with education, but you can read the top 10 books on happiness and then you'll know more about happiness. But unless you apply the principles, you're not going to be happier. Yeah. Happiness takes work. Happiness is a choice. And because we're imperfect human beings, and I wanted, this is the last thing I want to share about uh, the seven paths, is Self-forgiveness is crucial to one's own happiness because we are making mistakes. When we're under stress, we make more mistakes. I can't tell you how many mistakes I've made the last 45 days. And I catch myself, I'm like, Ilya, what's wrong with you? You're getting dementia. What, what's trying to happen to your brain? Because sometimes I'm overwhelmed. Well, when the system is overwhelmed, it doesn't function properly. Yes. Just like a car and just like a company, right? It's the same thing. So when that happens, how will we treat ourselves with self-forgiveness, which is an act of self-compassion, honestly, or with criticism, or, or, or the poor me again, or I don't know what to do. No, we have to navigate through our own imperfections as human beings. But when we do that, and you know, I, I, I'm laughing a lot more at my mistakes now than I ever have my entire life. Maybe that happens when you get older, I don't know. <laughs> but I'm not taking myself too seriously when I make mistakes. And as a result, I believe that I'm happier. I think there's something very powerful in what you're saying, because that forgiveness of oneself, but also of the other person who wasn't so nice when they said something to you. And, and there's a lot of, of energy going to places that are sort of not where you would like them to go right now. And so it's let it go. It's not that important. They didn't really mean, and there's sort of this, this let it, so sometimes I'm even counseling people, it's okay. I have a hunch they are as stressed out as you are. Let them forgive them. Um, it's, it's, there's interesting stuff. Coach Khan, please. No, I would concur on that. And I think carrying it forward, that needs to be our transition point. Once we get through this crisis, I mean, you know, as well as I know, Andy, from, from, from your studies of Greece and ancient Greek, the word crisis is an ancient Greek word. Yes, and it in many ways, it, it, it's loosely translated as essentially a judgment or a test. And the ancient Greeks believed that their gods at the time Every time something like this devastation came down, an unexpected change like this, something that impacts their health, their well-being, their environment, their safety, they saw that as a test. And for many of us, this is a test. We can choose to feel empowered. We can follow the keys to build the resilience that we need to get through this, to get to the other side. And what's on the other side? Our opportunity to become happier, our opportunity to become more fulfilled. And hopefully, again, let's not waste this crisis, this judgment. Yes. Let's use this as an opportunity to change those things that we, we, we needed to change. You started off with that, with that wonderful expression about the fact that, you know what, if you don't have a good crisis to work with, manufacture it in order to make that change happen. Yes. We have plenty of opportunities here to make the changes <laughs> that we need. Now, let's turn this around. Let's turn this, let's see this as an opportunity. Because sometimes, you know, the universe says, if you don't get it in a subtle way, I'm really going to keep knocking louder and louder until you hear me. I think we're all paying attention now. Well, I do think that today's conversation has been an inspiration to me, I'm sure to our listeners as well, on, on multiple levels. Um, I always ask for a few things you don't want them to forget. I have a bunch here I don't want them to forget either. I'll start with Coach Khan. Two or three things you don't want our listeners to forget. 
and then I'll go to Dr. Elia, and then I'll share my two or three ahas, please. Well, for me, the big, the, the big takeaways from here is don't be afraid. Give yourself permission to take care of yourself, yes. to listen and understand where you are. Recognize if you're feeling like a victim, if you're feeling like a critic, if you're feeling like a bystander, what's missing? Take a look at that, recognize that, fill that up so you can become a navigator on the other end and you can really take positive action by yourself and by other people. And Dr. Elia, thank you. Dr. Coach Khan. I mean, for me, is uh, take action, honestly. Uh, we can no longer afford to sit on the sidelines. Um, this is a big test, multiple tests that we're taking at the same time. Some of them are essays, some of them are multiple choice tests. <laughs> <laughs> but we need to... We need to step up and it's time for us to ace them. Um, I, we will navigate through all of these crises, and we will come to the other side in wiser, I hope, softer hearts, more open minds, uh, ser serving and, and being kind to those around us, a better human beings and a better society as a whole. But you got to put it into action. We can't just talk about it anymore. We got to put it into action. Well, and, and that also means that we're going to have um, we preach always to have small wins. Um, you don't have to have it perfect. And you're not quite sure where we're going, which is always unsettling people. They want to have a certainty in the future so they can live today to get there. It's not that easy. And we don't even have a Google map that's going to tell you when to learn, turn left or right. Um, but small wins can get you out of the sit still doing nothing. So think about a couple of things I can do. We're going to follow Dr. Elia, and we're not going to just learn about this, but, you know, as Coach Khan is preaching it, we're going to actually do something. And so the question is, what's a small win you can do? Which person can you call and say, I was thinking about you, um, you know, and I miss you. Can we talk? That's just a little something. Um, but do it with yourself as well. You know, go take that long walk and say, I'm entitled to go for my walk and I don't need to feel guilt about it. Um, but you also, I mean, some of us are blessed not to have been sick, but others that we know have been very sick. And the question is, how do we reach out and just be a community of caring at a time when people need it? So, you know, my hope is that people listen to our podcast, watch our videos, but come away transformed in a fashion that they start and then let us know that it's working for them. So um, any other last thoughts, my friends? And then we can find out how they can reach you. Yeah, my only last thought really is uh, you're such a fantastic interviewer and you bring so much wisdom and light. I mean, the, the way you phrase the questions, you know, helps us to be on our A game actually being interviewed because we get interviewed all the time. In some interviews, you know, you kind of like you have to walk, it's like a walk in the park. It's easy. With you, we have to pay attention. <laughs> so you raise the bar of the interviewing and you, I think you made us better. And, and I thank you for having us on your, uh, on your show. I really appreciate you very much. Well, that is so kind. It's a pleasure to have smart people like yourselves here. And Coach Khan, any last thoughts? Uh, I, I don't think, will I ever stop calling you Coach Khan and Dr. Elia? Um, uh, well, I would, I, would, I would echo Dr. Elia's sentiments about that. Thank you for the opportunity. And, and even your last thoughts stimulated something in my mind. Uh, I, I don't know if I shared this with you earlier. Part of the reason why I'm called Coach Khan is not just because I coach executives, but I give back to my community by coaching young student yes, athletes. I heard read right about that. Right now, of little 10 year old girls that we're trying to remotely navigate through this as our season has been canceled throughout the country. And a big part of that is they, they teach me lessons every day. But one of the things, our mantras that we have is that I asked them, I said, practice makes, and the natural reaction is perfect. I said, no practice makes permanent ah. good practice makes perfect so the incremental progress that we need to keep making that's what we need to be doing to strive for that and even with your audience if they apply little things every day that practice that practice every day will make it a permanent now do you want it to be a good permanent <laughs> you gotta practice good practice that's how uh, those habits are created um, my last ending for those listening is three acts of grace. Say at the end of the day, three things that you're grateful for and you will sleep well tonight. I'm grateful to have Dr. Elia and Coach Khan. It's such a pleasure to know you. We'll share this again. But I also think that um, our job is to help you, if you're on the brink, get off the brink and soar. 
And, and I also know that it's not exactly the same way you used to do it. So let us help you see, feel, and think in new ways. My job is to help you change. And more or less, people hate me because they don't want to change. And now they have to. So our job is to lend a hand. And it's just a pleasure and a privilege to be able to share this. Those of you who listen, thank you for your emails. They're terrific. Info at andysimon.com. And stay in touch. Let us know who you want to hear from. I get requests all the time to please bring so-and-so on, and I truly appreciate it and try to share it. And if you liked our show, let us know, and we'll bring you Dr. Con <laughs> Dr. Elia and Coach Khan back again. I'm never sure I'm going to get rid of the coach and the doctor. What a pleasure. <laughs> Goodbye, gentlemen. Thank you again. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you.